Hello everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I am Ted, your host, and for this lecture we are going to continue right along in our discussion of the ancient Near East, um, and in particular with our focus on Mesopotamia. So in our last lecture, where we last left off, we were discussing the uh, we were discussing the formation of the first territorial states in uh, the ancient Near East. That would be the Empire of Sargon, the Akkadian Empire. Uh, and Sargon emerged on the scene first as the king of Kish. Uh, he used a very large um, Akkadian army, uh, numbered at its height to be around 5,400 men. And with this army, uh, and with the knowledge of the, uh, the wealth and the trade resources, he set about uh, conquering the cities of Sumer. Uh, he united Sumer and Akkad. He prided himself in being known as the king of Sumer and Akkad. Uh, he brought the Elamites, he brought Elam into the fold, uh, and then he arced out and he made stunning conquest, uh, moving uh, this nascent Sumerian, Akkadian, Mesopotamian culture and civilization out from Mesopotamia and into the sort of uh, the uh, the cultures around the uh, the foothills of the Zagros Mountains, arcing out out of Mesopotamia into uh, what is now the what is now uh, Syria, um, bordering the the uh, the shores of the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, Sargon's empire was ex um, supported by a very large um, army that he supported with very high taxes. He taxed the cities of Sumer in particular very high, uh, very very highly to support his army with the material and the agricultural um, necessity to maintain that force. Sargon's empire that doesn't last long, it lasts about a hundred years, um, after which it simply fragments into, uh, into pieces, the city-states return. Um, in the wake of Sargon's conquest, a light had been shown, had been shown onto the peoples of Mesopotamia in that it is possible to unite all of these regions. Previously, Sumerian wars had simply been about um, outlying farming districts and access to trade routes. Now the Sumerians know that they can unite all of the cities and simply rule as, uh, has the great Lugal, has a king. And the Lugal of Ur, Ur-Namu, he, he follows in uh, Sargon's footsteps and he creates the Sumerian Empire. He unites the city of Sumer, the cities of Sumer. He incorporates Elam and he incorporates Akkad into this single territorial entity. And he also branches out uh, once again following Sargon and takes over the trade routes and the cities of the trade routes um, of what is now uh, Syria and the eastern, uh, the eastern Mediterranean. Um, and it is uh, Ernamu's son, Shulgi, who issues uh, a, a very broad uh, law code that is uh, that, that, that only survived to us in fragments. We do not have the full body of laws, but it is, uh, it is um, intended to serve as a unifying legal code, a unifying series of laws, set of laws that will bind um, Sumeria, Acadia, and Elam together. Um, the, these regions that are so interti intertwined, so interconnected. Uh, it is also under Shulgi that finally the great tales, the epics of the of the Sumerians are finally recorded. So we have the, the birth of a uh, Sumerian and Akkadian literature, li liter um, la literary tradition being, um, being uh, initiated under Shulgi. Um, now, the Sumerian, like the Akkadian Empire, is once again destroyed by uh, invaders coming from the east, uh, the, the hill peoples. Uh, the Gudians uh, sack um, Asagarde, bringing down the Akkadian Empire, and it is the Elamites who mobilize and invade and attack Ur, um, breaking down the Sumerian Empire. And in the wake of both of these, uh, both of these uh, imperial collapses, a new group of people will emerge and unite the region once more. Now, both the Akkadians and the Sumerians faced a major problem with border security. They could not effectively control the areas outside of Mesopotamia. They were able to, at times, project their strength uh, to the border regions, but they were never fully able to bring the, the fringe people, the fringe areas, to heal. Uh, this was the case for the Sumerian Empire, which was undone by a group known as the Amur Amuru, or the, uh, the Amorites. Uh, 
And, and now Amuru or, or Amorai simply designated the people as Westerners. And, uh, and it's used in the Akkadian and the Sumerian languages to, to denote them. Uh, they spoke a language related to the Akkadians. And between 2000 and 1800 BCE, they migrated east into Mesopotamia and they seized power in a number of Mesopotamian cities, uh, places such as Larsa, Mari, Ishin, and Ashana. They adopted Akkadian as their administrative language since they were close to their own. Uh, they, uh, this migration transformed Mesopotamia. The Sumerians, uh, the, the Sumerian language is lost to us at this point. Uh, the Sumerian separate identity, uh, the people of the noble land, the black haired people, that identity is lost. Sumerian institutions survive. The Amorites did not establish a unified state, uh, and Mesopotamia slipped back into this sort of fractured uh, state with a handful of regional powers. Now, an Amorite dynast named Hammurabi from what was really uh, then a tent city named Babylon emerged as the leading figure in southwestern Mesopotamia, in southern Mesopotamia, I should say. Um, Hammurabi would spend 40 years uniting the regional states and forged the Babylonian Empire. Uh, and this empire was centered on the city of Babylon, which was transformed from a tent city to a, a city of the first order, a, a first class city. In, in Babylon, the institutions that we have been observing become perfected. A rebirth of learning occurs, a renaissance uh, essentially occurs. Babylon evolves to fill the great imperial slash cultural role left vacant by the fall, uh, by the sack and, and subsequent fall of the cities of Ur and Asagarde. Uh, the two great cities in southern and northern Mesopotamia, their fall, uh, they fall, they're lost to us. And Babylon emerges as the, the great political, economic, and social center in Mesopotamia. Babylon remains in that position um, throughout antiquity, and it's only really uh, recently in human civil and human civilization, um, with the founding of Baghdad in the early Middle Ages, that Mesopotamia is displaced as the great city of uh, that the Babylon is displaced as the great city of Mesopotamia. Now, Hammurabi spent 40 years of his reign bringing the regional states that emerged after the fall of the Sumerian Empire under his control. Hammurabi inherited many innovations and patterns uh, for success. Uh, he inherited these from the Sumerian kings and from the Akkadian kings, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the families of Sargon and, um, and Ur-Namu. He inherited these from those kings. In each Mesopotamian city, a service aristocracy of great families were already accustomed to serving a great imperial figure that existed. The families spawned noblemen who were well versed in serving as governors, ministers, courtiers, uh, and, and these men were largely bereft for the most part of personal aspiration to succeed to the imperial dignity. Hammurabi also inherited a proud and vaunted military tradition that extended all the way back to pre-dynastic city states. Another benefit in, in, uh, of Hammurabi, uh, another benefit that he um, uh, favored from, was a shift in the course of the Euphrates during the course of the Amorite migration. That, that is uh, between the years 2000 BCE and 18, uh, 1800 BCE. The change in the river's course helps to propel Babylon to the primacy of all Mesopotamian cities. Uh, Babylon becomes the nexus, the focal point of trade routes. The cities that suffer or lost out um, were, were, were cities like Ur. Ur lost her port and uh, thus lead her access to the sea. And the cities of southern Mesopotamia, the old Sumerian heartland, they lose their access to the sea as the rivers begin to silt up and form marshlands. Now the inhabitants um, uh, of southern Mesopotamia, they, they sort of uh, begin to, um, to reverse themselves. They sort of begin to uh, regress. Uh, and, and go back to a life based on life agri light agriculture and fishing. Um, they, they become the norms and the heavy industry and the heavy trade that dominated earlier centuries began to slowly fade away. Hammurabi was also a very skilled diplomat. He managed to isolate and one by one knock off his opponents. Um, he did this, uh, he, he, did, he managed to do this by the middle of his reign. Um, and, and, and literally, um, 
by knocking off his opponents individually, he was able to uh, establish a, a domain that stretched from the Persian Gulf almost to the Mediterranean Sea. It was not as large as Sargon's empire, but it was really better um, administered to Sargon's empire. Hammurabi's attention to detail was so outstanding that we know uh, of um, that, that we that we know of a series of surviving records between him and his governors, uh, the governors of various cities like Mari, um, and we have uh, what are known as the Mari letters that cover a wide range uh, and a wide variety of topics. Hammurabi improved the royal bureaucracy and he enlarged the royal scribe corps to meet the needs of, of, of these new demands. He innovated the imperial military readiness. He instituted a royal army that was always on call. He had a, a very large uh, royal army, a standing army, and he established a provincial reserve course that was drilled at regular intervals and that could count on traditions. Uh, they, they could trace their establishments going back for centuries. These were based on the, the local military forces of the old city-states. Uh, in addition to that large standing army that, um, or the innovation of this uh, all-powerful, already standing army that, that Sargon had, had brought to bear. Now, this force was mainly an infantry force, but it was supplemented by archers and light infantry skirmishers, uh, made up mainly of missile troops who hurled javelins. There is no evidence of war chariots in, in, uh, in Hammurabi's uh, armies. The Babylonian Empire um, was nonetheless very impressive. Now, Hammurabi is most famous for his law code, which survives to us in the present. It was carved on it was carved on on stone slabs, and multiple copies were distributed throughout the empire. There are stone slabs of it, and then there are baked clay tablets of it. Um, we we know we know they were distributed throughout the Babylonian Empire. Now, the copy of this law code. Uh, that, that survives to us, the one that we use, was actually taken as a war trophy uh, and we found it in Elam, it was taken by the Elamites. Um, and, and as you can uh, pick up on every couple of hundred years, uh, the Elamites simply came into Mes uh, Mesopotamia and simply sacked a couple of the cities before we're heading, heading back to the Iranian plateau. Um, the, the laws of the Code of Hammurabi are quite sophisticated and rested on nearly 2,000 years of, of, of advancements. Uh, the code rests on earlier legal precedents, to be sure, um, from, from throughout Mesopotamia uh, and, and throughout the other uh, rulers, um, many of which are, are, are uh, known to us but only descend to us in fragments. Now, the code is important to Mesopotamia because it was written in Akkadian. And at this point, Akkadian had become the popular language of the region. Uh, and uh, I mean popular, not that a lot of people liked it, but that it was the working language. It was the language that most people spoke and most people did business with uh, in, and most people uh, conversed in. Uh, and that, that is, uh, is, uh, it is reflected as a major shift because, uh, as noted earlier, Akkadian ceased to function as a, as a working language. The, uh, um, the, the, the loss of that Sumerian identity um, sort of displaced the Sumerian language and the Akkadian language becomes the language used throughout Mesopotamia. Uh, the Babylonians, the, the Amorites, they drop their own language and they pick up Akkadian and they use Akkadian. Uh, it was an accomplishment to improve Akkadian and to raise it to the uh, to the status of being an official language of a of an empire, um, the, Bab the Babylonians in a, in, uh, in essence put Akkadian through uh, the same put the Akkadian language I should say uh, through the same adaptations and expansion that the Sumerian language had to make earlier. In many cases, they had to adjust the prevailing legal traditions of Mesopotamia to fit in with Babylonian customs while also adopting some of the more uh, prized or the more treasured tradi traditions of these various regions, of these various cities. The Code of Hammurabi, while impressive in many ways, um, uh, is in many ways comparable to the much earlier imperial law codes. The laws are listed by categories and they reflect royal rulings on civil and criminal suits. Uh, the code was designed uh, and interpreted in such a way that allowed the royal judges to evaluate cases and make standard uniform rulings. We're going to have one legal standard, one legal 
tradition throughout this entire uh, domain. We're not going to have random individuals uh, making random decisions for random uh, uh, for random cases. Um, it's going to be one one sort of uniform standard throughout all of Hammurabi's empire. Um, a major step forward for civic governance, um, and, and that was simply to have essentially the same social guidelines throughout all of Hammurabi's empire, through all of uh, Mesopotamia. Furthermore, the Code of Hammurabi will serve as the guide, as the, uh, the template for future peoples and future states in the ancient Near East when they developed their own laws, when they, when they, uh, when they ordered their own civil civilizations. The Code of Hammurabi um, fills this, uh, fills this and it, it, uh, it allows them to sort of build. And again, this is the benefit of writing. Uh, future peoples looking to order, uh, to create order and established, um, and establish themselves and establish their states, they can go back and they can pick up Hammurabi's law code and they can use that as a template, they can add to it, they can subtract to it, they can make it their own. They, they can use writing to do that. Um, so, we, so we see the, the legacy of writing, we see the impact of writing echoing throughout the ages. Now, Hammurabi's law code also falls into uh, what was now becoming a very well-established pattern of linking the ruler and the gods. Has, uh, uh, has Hammurabi depicted as the divine agent on earth who leads the people and is the source of justice and order, um, being, uh, being a person who receives the laws from the gods. Now, the bulk of the Code of Hammurabi is mainly comprised of what we would call civil law, which is a pretty good index on how advanced Babylonian civil civilization was. The code reveals interesting facts about the society, namely rules for divorce and inheritance, uh, women's rights to property, and these would have been based on the extensive history of trade that we have covered. Um, um, has uh, has uh, has contract law also features pr um, prominently into Hammurabi's law code. Um, it, 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 and contract law really covered in depth. There are many statutes, many laws that call for agitated by settlement. Uh, silver was in great supply. We, we know that because these payments were stipulated to be made in silver. Uh, the code reveals the existence of slaves in the, in the Babylonian Empire. Um, and, and the code lays out that there are, uh, that there are supposed to be uh, treatments and occupations um, that, that, that slaves are supposed to uh, occupy, um, and also the treatment of the slaves. Uh, they, they, they lay out what is, uh, what is appropriate and what is inappropriate for a slave to do. Uh, these slaves are entering Babylon through a well-established slave trade and, and, and also through wars of conquest. Now, the criminal laws are harsh. Um, they're what we call retaliatory laws. They prescribe similar or like punishment for offenses. They call for reciprocal punishments or actions that result in a loss of a limb or of a family member, literally calling for an eye for an eye. Um, and, I mean, and, I, and by that, I mean making the literal distinction that if you cause someone to lose their left eye, you must lose your left eye. If your actions contribute to someone losing their right arm, your right arm has to be taken uh, as a punishment. It is, it is right for right, wrong for wrong. Um, the purpose of this, uh, and, and really the pur uh, part of uh, any law code, is to ensure that families accept royal justice and do not degenerate into a, a blood feud, that they do not sort of disrupt uh, Hammurabi civilization by, by going out and, and seeking vengeance for themselves. Now, the Babylonian Empire continues until 1540 BCE when it is overthrown by a group of people called the Kassites. And the Kassites come in from Iran. They, they move in and they take over Mesopotamia. Now the, now the Kassites do not alter things in Mesopotamia. They merely overlay themselves as the new imperial elites in Mesopotamia. Uh, both the ba uh, Babylonians and the Kassites oversee the mass reproduction of Sumerian epic poems like the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, and of course the, uh, the Great Flood Epic. Um, the Asudra of Shuprak, uh, of Shuparak, I, I should say, uh, who is uh, befriended by the god um, Enki and the Sumerian uh, god of sweet waters, um, uh, and, uh, and who is literally saved from a flood by Enki, who 
um, who advises him to build an ark. Um, and, and really, the uh, the flood epic of uh, the Asudra is, is the uh, is the basis. Uh, it will later serve as the basis for the uh, for the uh, the flood epic in, in biblical accounts. It's the uh, the story of Noah. Uh, in the years following the death of Hammurabi, uh, these independent epic stories are drafted, and uh, and then they really come into uh, to being a, a full literary body. That that um that full. Mesopotamian literary tradition, that Sumerian epic uh, tradition that I spoke of earlier. Uh, and it should be noted that these Sumerian tales are written in Akkadian for a Babylonian audience. Um, so that sort of gives you a bit of continuity in Mesopotamia at the time. Um, and, and, and it's really it, the Babylonian poets who take writing in Akkadian, um, who, are, who are writing in Akkadian and they take Akkadian and they begin the transition of turning the old Sumerian stories into the literary masterpieces of this region. Now, Babylon is established at the cultural and intellectual center of the ancient Near East. It will be seen by every new power coming into the Near East has the 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 uh, the epic center, the at the epicenter of the uh, of their of their power of their control of the Near East. If you control the Near East, you must control Babylon. Hammurabi establishes patterns of kingship, uh, the tradition of administration, the military organization, the power of the king, and the policy of the king uh, to provide justice will become the basic job description of the great king, any imperial figure in Mesopotamia. And the institutions used to accomplish that job um, that, that would uh, endure until the collapse of the Ottoman Empire um, and the, and the Ottoman Emperor, the Ottoman Sultans, were the last of the great successors in, in the Near East, these great royal successors of Hammurabi and of Shulgi and of Sargon. Uh, that, that will continue until the, the end of World War I when the Ottoman Empire collapses. Um, Hammurabi's reforms endured, but his state did not. Uh, the Babylonians remained a very potent force in Mesopotamian affairs until the emergence of the Hittites. Uh, and it's the Hittites under their king Merciless I who come down from Asia Minor and they sack Babylon in 1595. Uh, the Hittites sack weakened Babylon and allowed the Kassites to invade and take over. And at this point we're, uh, we're pretty far advanced into Mesopotamian history and at this point I just like to shift our focus and travel over to the Nile River Valley uh, and examine uh, what was happening in Kemet and Taseti, ancient Egypt and ancient Nubia. Um, and we've alluded to, to Egypt before. We've alluded, we've alluded to Egypt in our earlier lectures but we haven't really delved into the developments there. Um, we have just made comparisons between Egypt and Mesopotamia. Uh, we haven't fully examined the ancient civilization, and we will do that now. We will begin with the old kingdom of ancient Egypt, beginning in 3100 BCE. Uh, and, and we know a lot about ancient Egypt. We have excellent archaeological evidence. We have excellent documents from the great writers of antiquity, like Manetho and Herodotus. We also have great sources from the Egyptians themselves. We have a lot of sources, a lot of text from the ancient Egyptians uh, them themselves. And from these sources, we are able to piece together a very good sequence of events tracing the successive dynasties that ruled over Egypt. Uh, the great literary works, the religious beliefs, the social structure, and the pastimes of ancient Egypt. To begin with, I would like to go over the earliest and the most basic attributes of Egyptian civilization. In earlier lectures, I noted that the Nile River Valley was wetter than it is today, uh, which invalidated the, the great push to organize concentrated urban centers. Uh, it also made the, the need to farm uh, intensively impractical and unnecessary since wild grasses could be cared for on a, on a limited basis and gathered to, to complement a steady diet of fish and aquatic fowl. I uh, stated that there was uh, there is an ongoing controversy regarding the domestication of cattle and wheat um, and and the source of uh, of their origin in Egypt. Uh, the desertification of the North African savanna, uh, the woodlands, uh, that began around 8,000 to 10,000 BCE and that ended around 4,500 BCE, had the effect of restricting the arable land in the Nile River Valley 
and restricting the course of the Nile River. Uh, the change in the environment led to a change in society and culture. Uh, from this point, the predictability of the Nile will make life much more easier for the ancient Egyptians. Uh, the flood patterns were quickly observed and exploited by the ancient Egyptians. The nature of the, of the Nile River also promoted cooperation and a homogeneous culture. Uh, the culture will last from roughly 3500 BCE down to the end of the Julio-Claudian dynasty um, around the year 68. Now, the, the Nile would also uh, dissect Egypt and play an important role in travel and communication. It became the essential point of reference for giving directions. And even today, in contemporary uh, Arab Miser, uh, and, and that is uh, that is what the Arabs refer to Egypt as uh, after the uh, the Arab conquest, after the uh, Rashidun conquest in the mid seventh uh, uh, century, uh, they begin to refer to Egypt as Miser, and Miser is a play on um, uh, it's, it's a reference to uh, Egypt being the land of the blacks. Uh, Miser was a descendant of Ham, uh, so going back to that whole Noah flood epic, uh, and of course it's it's, uh, it's Nub. In Arabic, but going back to uh, the whole flood epic and and uh, Ham being the, uh, the the progenitor of the black people um, and, and Misa being a descendant of Ham, they they apply that term to uh, to they apply that term to to Egypt. Now, um, even now, um, when you when you get to Egypt, when you get to to, to Misa, uh, the ancient directions for going upstream. Uh, of going upstream for traveling into the African interior or going downstream for traveling out to the Mediterranean are still used. The environment will also play a major role on the Egyptian outlook uh, of their society and also their religious, their, their cosmological view. They only viewed the world in terms of their natural surroundings. When the armies of Tuthmosis III reached the Tigris and Euphrates River and saw the rivers that flowed in the opposite directions going south instead of north, they were shocked. And the only way that they could rationalize this was to call it, uh, call the rivers the circling water that goes downstream when it is going upstream. So it's a bit of a intense localization uh, by, by these people when, when they uh, get out and they explore the world. Now geography also reveals a lot about ancient Egypt. It was protected by large deserts to the east and the west. Uh, these deserts could be crossed, but they could not be crossed easily. To the north, uh, the Nile marshes offered protection from seaborne attacks. You could still attack, but it wouldn't be easy. And to the south, the cataracts impeded uh, easy access um, on the Nile um, from, from the African interior. Uh, the Nile also made communications much more reliable and expedient. Uh, these factors would also uh, explain why, why Egypt developed this uh, very strong homogeneous culture based on a single language, a Hamitic or Afro language. Uh, the ancient language survived to us today. The ancient Egyptian language survived to us today. It is the liturgical or the religious language of the Coptic Christian church in Egypt. Um, the Nile also prompted this view of order um, because it was so ordered, because it was so structured, so regulated, it prompted a view of divine order, something known as Ma'at. And it serves as a very rich, um, a, a very rich environment for the creation of uh, epic, uh, of epics that uh, that form a distinction from the that, that form a, a distinction in, in Egyptian records, in, in Egyptian literature, from the Mesopotamian epics and Mesopotamian literature. Uh, it really goes in the opposite direction. Uh, there are no gods that man must fight to stave off chaos. In Egypt, the divine forces, the divine uh, figures, they care for the mortal. And they are both intertwined. Uh, this, this is the, uh, the basis that allowed for the creation of the earliest territorial state or kingdom that we know of. That, that would be Narmer's kingdom, um, founded back around 3100 BCE. Now, before the desertification of North Africa, we can classify the budding progenitors of Egyptian civil civilization as really sophisticated Neolithic villages. Uh, these villages formed or coalesced into what the Greeks um, report to be uh, to be gnomes, 
Uh, those are local districts that were administered by a nomarch. Uh, and, and nom and nomarch are Greek words for the local regional um, administrators and these local regional districts. Each nom developed market towns and worship centers, but nothing that we can call true cities like what we saw developing in Mesopotamia. And at this point, we're going to break here and we're going to come back and we're going to continue to look at the uh, development of Egyptian civilization and Egyptian culture and we're going to look at the career of Narmer. As always, I am Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment and I will see you guys next time for another lecture.